Welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and this is Exploration. Every week on Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. And today, we're going to bring on two scientists because the Large Hadron Collider is up and running. The Large Hadron Collider is the most expensive machine of science ever built. It is 27 miles in circumference, costing about $10 billion. It is built outside the city of Geneva. In fact, you could practically put the city of Geneva inside this gigantic machine. Some people think it will create a black hole that will eat up the Earth. Wrong. The machine has already been operation, and it's at half power now. It should be full power next year, and it should be able to perhaps test the periphery of a theory that I work on. This is what I do for a living. It's called string theory, which is what I do in my day job. Well, we have two people today to talk about string theory, higher dimensions, the universe. The first is Brian Greene, author of The Elegant Universe and The Fabric of the Universe. And he's a professor of physics at Columbia University. And the second physicist we're going to bring on is Professor Lisa Randall of Harvard University. She's the author of the book Warp Passages. And so once again, we are going to be talking about the fundamental question. What is the world made of anyway? And is the world really three-dimensional? Or is it really 10-dimensional, perhaps even 11-dimensional? And for that matter, are there other universes out there, something which is predicted by string theory? All of this we'll discuss in today's program, including, of course, the Large Hadron Collider, which is now up and running, running at half power, and it should perhaps test the periphery, we hope, of this fabulous theory called string theory. That is, a theory of everything. Now, let me explain. Ever since the days of the ancient Greeks, we believed in something called atoms. Tiny little particles, infinitesimal particles that make up our human body and the universe we see around us. However, recently we believe that these particles are actually vibrating rubber bands. If you had a gigantic microscope and can peer right into the heart of an electron, you would see that it's not a dot at all, but it's a rubber band that vibrates. And as it vibrates at different frequencies, it looks like a different subatomic particle. And that's why we have so many subatomic particles that we hope to create when we smash atoms outside Geneva, Switzerland with the Large Hadron Collider. In the second half of exploration, we're going to bring on Lisa Randall, professor of physics at Harvard University. And she's the author of a book called Warp Passages. And talking about space warps, we think that these tiny subatomic particles will warp the fabric of space and time. And according to one of Lisa Randall's theories, this may open up a teensy-weensy black hole. Now, this is where the controversy begins. The question is, how dangerous are these subatomic black holes that might possibly be created at the Large Hadron Collider if Lisa Randall is correct? Well, according to the lawsuit filed in the state of Hawaii, the United States government should help to shut down this European machine by withdrawing funding because it'll create these tiny black holes which will then absorb the planet Earth. However, scientists have looked at it and came out with a report just last week stating no way. First of all, the Earth gets hit with subatomic particles much greater in energy than anything that could be created by this puny Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider, even though it looks big by our scale of measurements, is actually a pea shooter. It's actually just a tiny little pint-sized device compared to what Mother Nature can create. And the Earth is bathed in these cosmic rays all the time. And second of all, once these mini black holes are created, they disappear almost instantly. So there's no possibility of a chain reaction. So physicists are confident that we will, in fact, begin the process of pure science by turning on the Large Hadron Collider and then revealing some of the great secrets of the universe itself. Well, once again, our first special guest is Brian Green, and the book is called Fabric of the Cosmos. 
Okay. Now let's talk about the theme of your book. First of all, why did you write the book, The Fabric of the Cosmos? And why did you choose this concept, Fabric of the Cosmos? Sure. Well, when I was writing my first book, The Elegant Universe, that was the a book about the search for the unified theory. And in that book, space and time play a role, but they're kind of secondary. They're supporting characters. But I kind of found that when I was writing the book, it was as if space and time kept trying to take over. They kept trying to grab the spotlight. And I realized that there was another story that I felt I really wanted to tell, which would be the history, the story of space and time, you know, going back to Newton through Einstein and the cutting-edge developments that we're engaged with today with unified theories like string theory or M theory. So I really just felt that there was this need to tell this story of our changing perception of the arena of reality. And that's what the book is about. Okay, now let's talk about the Newtonian universe and the transition to the Einsteinian universe. The Newtonian universe is a very common sense universe. Uh, yes. One second on the Earth is a second on Mars, exactly. a second on Jupiter. Yeah. One meter on the Earth is one meter on Jupiter, is one meter and Andromeda. So now take us to the transition to the Einsteinian universe where all hell breaks loose. Sure. I mean, uh, basically, Einstein shattered Newton's common sense picture, the picture that you just paint, where there's an absolute space that exists everywhere throughout the cosmos, and it's the same for everyone. And Newton said there's an absolute time that ticks forward in the same way universally for anyone, regardless of what they're doing. That common sense picture completely went out the window when Einstein discovered his special theory of relativity, because in special relativity, if, for example, you and I are moving relative to each other, our clocks, our watches, will literally tick off time at different rates. Our brain processes, our heartbeats, will beat, will tick, will go forward at different rates if we are moving relative to one another. It's, I like to think of it it's as if Einstein kind of shattered the universality of time in the Newtonian picture, and each of us picks up a little shard of time. It becomes our personal clock, and we carry forward with that into the future. So it's a very different picture of time, and in fact, there's a different picture of space as well. Similarly, what you consider a meter and I consider a meter can be different if we are moving relative to each other. Very strange, but that's what relativity teaches us. Now, therefore, paradoxes abound. Uh, any freshman taking freshman physics immediately comes in contact with paradoxes. If, if uh, the concept of length and time are not absolute, then you can have two people each shorter than the other, two people each younger than the other. And many classical physicists uh, rip their hair out trying to contemplate people each being younger than the other. So have all the paradoxes of relativity been resolved? Yeah, all of them have been completely resolved. They are often puzzling because, as you say, there can be examples where you look at a situation and you think that each individual, say, would be younger than the other because each had a clock that was ticking at a slower rate than the other. But the solution to all of these paradoxes is relativity. It's relative. When you look at two distant beings, there is a distinct notion of time that applies to each. So you are comparing apples and oranges when you try to compare clocks that are separate from each other in space. The only way to truly compare two clocks is to bring them back together. And it turns out, and this is the crux of all of the solutions to these paradoxes, when you bring the clocks back together, you necessarily introduce an asymmetry. One clock, for instance, has to turn around to rejoin a clock that it initially was next to. And in that turning around process, the symmetry between the two clocks is broken. And indeed, one clock, in fact, a clock that went out and came back in its motion, will truly be the one that has less time elapsed on it compared to the one that stood still. All paradoxes evaporate. So in other words, if two people are each younger than the other, to determine who really is younger than the other, you have to bring them together. Exactly. All right. Now let's talk about the direction of time. Einstein himself did not write that much about why time moves forward in a certain direction. However, we all know that dead people don't come out of the grave, get younger, and jump into the womb of their mother. 
Uh, we all know that broken eggs don't jump out of the frying pan and go into the eggshell, but there's nothing in the laws of physics per se at the microscopic level that prevents time from going backwards. Yes. So in your book, you have a discussion of the arrow of time. Could you elaborate? Sure. The arrow of time is a real puzzle in fundamental physics because, as you say, we are all familiar with events going one way in time and not the reverse. You gave some very good examples, eggs splattering, people aging, and so forth. It always happens in one direction. Now, you'd think that since that's such a basic feature of everyday experience, that you'd be able to see why that's the case from the fundamental laws of physics themselves. But regardless of which laws we look at, be they the laws of Newton, the laws of Einstein, the laws of string theory, laws that you have developed, that I have worked on as well, all of those laws show a complete symmetry between forward in time and backward in time. The experience of time going only one way or the other seems not to be found in the basic laws of physics themselves, and that's a real puzzle. Now, when we study this puzzle in more detail, surprisingly enough, we find that the resolution requires us to look all the way back to the beginning of time, all the way back to the Big Bang itself. And we believe that the Big Bang had certain very special features at very high order. We, in this trade, of course, as you know, call it very low entropy. And we believe that this very order, this very low entropy beginning to the universe is what imprinted a direction on time. And we have been experiencing the drive to ever more disorder ever since that pristine starting point. I mean, as everybody knows, things typically like to get disordered. Your house typically gets messy. It never spontaneously becomes clean and so forth. That drive to disorder starting with the highly ordered beginning with the Big Bang, we believe, is why events always go one direction in time and not the reverse. Now, Hawking tried to take this even one step further. Uh, Stephen Hawking believed at one point that if the universe expanded and then contracted, that time would reverse itself sure. yeah. and that uh, all this entropy stuff that we've been talking about would run the other way. However, I understand that Stephen King has since uh, uh, renounced this version. Yeah, that was a, it was a mistake. You know, everybody makes mistakes, and even Hawking, genius that he is, he did make a mistake and misread the mathematics to imply that if the universe were to expand to a maximum size and then start to contract, that in that turnaround, the amount of entropy in the universe would start to get smaller and smaller, so that people would unage and eggs would unbreak and so forth. But in reality, that isn't what he now believes. It's not what anybody really believes. We do believe that entropy or disorder will always increase into the future, regardless of how space expands, and therefore the arrow of time always points in one direction. It doesn't flip around. So it's rather mind-boggling realizing that in some sense the reason why eggs splatter, it has to do with the origin of the universe itself. Yeah, totally. That really blows my mind. You know, every time you drop an egg, it really is tapping into, it's reflecting a feature of the origin of the universe. Amazing. Now let's talk about something that Einstein felt uncomfortable about and actually wanted to subsume into a larger theory, and that is the, the quantum theory. Now, the quantum theory is the theory of atomic physics. Electrons dance in our uh, PCs, and the electronic age with fiber optics and lasers are all dependent on the quantum theory. But the quantum theory is also dependent on something called uncertainty, and this is what made Einstein very uneasy. Uh, could you elaborate? Sure. Heisenberg, a physicist in the 20th century, came up with this so-called uncertainty principle through his research into the quantum theory, into quantum mechanics. And the uncertainty principle basically says that there are features of the micro world that you can't ever know with complete precision. And the best example, the simplest example, is you take one of those electrons that you were just mentioning. The uncertainty principle, when applied to an electron, says that you cannot know where an electron is and how fast the electron is moving simultaneously with total precision. And this has nothing to do with how good equipment you have or how good an experiment you are. There is a fundamental limit 
on these features of the microworld in terms of their acquiring definite values. And that's the uncertainty that this principle declares. Now, some of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century didn't like this formulation. Erwin Schrodinger, uh, the man who helped to formulate the wave function of quantum theory, didn't like this. And he proposed the Schrodinger cat problem to show that this was ridiculous, that if I have a cat in a box and the cat is connected to a gun, gun is connected to, let's say, uranium, and uh, a Geiger counter then registers the uranium disintegrating, sets off the gun and kills the cat. So far, so good. However, quantum mechanics says that until you open a box, you don't really know what state the cat is in because you don't know what state the uranium atom is in. So in other words, before you look at a cat, the cat exists both simultaneously dead and alive. Now, how can you be both dead and alive? Uh, Schrodinger thought this was absurd and thought that this was a disproof of the fundamental uh, postulates of the uncertainty principle. But, well, what are your thoughts? Well, indeed, the Schrodinger cat paradox is so troubling because it takes the bizarre features of the quantum world, which we normally think of as applying to particles, like electrons, and it scales it up and makes it apply to big objects, big everyday objects, like a cat, an example that you are describing. So whereas we don't feel so troubled by saying an electron can sort of be partly this way, partly that way, partly to the left or partly to the right, we definitely do find it very troublesome to say that when it comes to a cat, that the cat is here or there or partly dead or partly alive. It does sound completely nutty. I personally feel that there is a resolution to this paradox or this strangeness that has been developed in the last few decades. And what it does, it recognizes that the conclusion that the cat would be partly dead or partly alive takes into account only the local environment of the cat itself. It doesn't take into account the fact that the cat actually interacts with a global environment. The cat is being impinged upon by air molecules. It's being hit by photons of light and so forth. You can't ever cut the cat off completely from its surroundings. And it turns out, and this is great, when you take the full environment into account, it shows, according to quantum theory, that the mixture of being half dead and half alive goes away, that the cat is one or the other, not both. Now, there are subtleties. Frankly, we still need to work out in this picture, so I don't want to give the impression that it's all fully worked out, but I think that the key feature is you must include the environment and people neglected the environment for a long time just to make matters simple, to make the math simple. But when you include the environment, things do start to look less puzzling. Okay, but there's still a question of probabilities, even if you yes. have interaction with the environment. Yes. And when we had Steve Weinberg on the air, uh, he mentioned the analogy with uh, sitting in a room with lots of radio frequencies in your room. Uh, there are many frequencies, radio frequencies in your room. You're listening to this radio station, but in the room you have the frequencies of all radio stations. But you're tuned in to one frequency. So you exist simultaneously in a world with many, many radio frequencies, but you tune into one. So these other radio frequencies, he claims, are universes. In one universe, the cat is dead. In the other universe, the cat is alive. But you happen to be tuned into one where because of the interactions with the environment, the cat happens to be alive. Yes. But that means that someplace in your room, in your very room, there is a wave function, a radio frequency, of a cat in which the cat is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's true, it means that there are, in some sense, all possible worlds coexisting simultaneously in your living room. Sure. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, that's, in fact, the point when I said that I didn't feel everything had been completely worked out. It's exactly that issue, how to deal with the fact that even if the cat isn't in a mixture of being half dead and half alive, there still are the probabilities of being one half dead and one half alive. And what does that mean? I don't know exactly what it means. I don't think anybody really does. But one proposal certainly is the one that you're describing, the one that Steven Weinberg apparently described, which is there are multiple universes. And in one universe, the cat is dead. And in another universe, 
the cat is alive, and when you open the box and, for instance, you see live, it means you're tuning in to that particular one. You've entered into that branch, if you will, of this ever-branching tributary of universes. I am a little uncomfortable with that idea. It is so uneconomical to imagine that there are many, many universes out there, and we're just experiencing one of an infinite number. That doesn't mean it's not right. It may be right. I'm open to it being right. But I also think that we need to continue thinking hard on this problem because there may be solutions that don't require this kind of a radical change to our very sense of reality. But if that is ultimately where we are led, I think it's fantastically exciting. If this is really true, then there are many universes out there. That's exciting. But I don't want to go to that conclusion until there is no other possibility when it's the only one left standing. Now, of course, in Twilight Zone, they like to, to play with this kind of idea. In one Twilight Zone episode, a man wakes up and finds out he never lived in the world. All his friends don't recognize him. He meets his mother and father, and they say that we never had a son. Mm. But that means that perhaps the mother had a miscarriage. And a miscarriage is caused by one quantum event, let's say, one cosmic ray that went through his mother's womb, causing a, a miscarriage, and that's why he wasn't born. So, in other words, one quantum event separates you from a world where you don't exist from a world where you do exist. And Frank Wilczek, who we've also interviewed at, um, at Princeton and also in Santa Barbara, um, he was of the opinion that, yeah, we have to just get used to the idea that these other worlds exist. And uh, we also had um, the, one of the originators of the inflation theory at MIT, Alan Guth, on the radio. And he said that you just have to get used to the idea that in one universe, Elvis Presley is still alive. Right. That makes, no doubt, some people very happy. And so, so you're right. There are many physicists. Frank Wilczek is a great proponent of the world's interpretation of quantum theory. There are many physicists who do take this interpretation on board fully. I'm not saying it's wrong. In fact, if I was asked to choose one interpretation of quantum theory and defend it, I think I would probably choose the many worlds interpretation because there are features of it that really do address key problems in our formulation of quantum mechanics. So don't get me wrong. I think it's a viable and certainly a worthwhile interpretation to study. I just am not sure it's the only one, and I'm not sure it's the best one. And that's why I think we need to keep working. Okay, now let's take, make the next big jump, uh, the jump to string theory, which makes the claim of uniting um, Einstein's theory of space and time with the quantum theory. So um, you've done this many times before, but could you explain briefly why string theory has this magical property of being able to unify the two great paradigms of the 20th century? Relativity of the theory of the very big and quantum theory, the theory of the very small. Sure, the, the basic reason has to do with the uncertainty that we were talking about a little while ago with quantum mechanics. Indeed, Heisenberg showed that when you are studying an electron, it can sort of jitter around because you can't say precisely where it is. And in fact, if you understand the uncertainty principle in mathematical terms, it shows you that the smaller the distance scale over which you examine an electron, the more wildly it jitters, the more wild the frenetic behavior becomes. So the lesson from quantum theory is the smaller you go, the more wild and turbulent the world is. Now, the reason why there's a conflict between quantum mechanics and general relativity is that when you examine the fabric of space, the fabric of space itself, on incredibly small scales, the quantum jitter is simply too violent for Einstein's theory to handle. And that's why the theories come into conflict, and that's why they break down. String theory comes along, and the way it resolves this problem is it says that the finest ingredient in the world is a little filament of energy, a little string. And the little string is tiny. It's about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's 100 billionth billionth the size of a nucleus, so it's really small. But because it has a non-zero size, and it is the smallest thing in the universe, you can't examine the world on scales any smaller than a string itself. You can't go any smaller than the smallest ingredient. And that means that the jitter from quantum theory is limited. You can't go to 
arbitrarily short distance scales. Therefore, you don't get the arbitrarily violent jitters that we thought you would encounter. String theory cuts it off. It sets a limit, and the limit is just right so that general relativity can cope with the amount of jitter that you can get, and it allows us to marry quantum theory and general relativity together. Okay, now let's talk about higher dimensions, because some people who believe in string theory say that it's a potential weakness, that we can't measure dimensions beyond length, width, and height. Other people say, well, why not? Why not have 10, 11 dimensions? It's, it's a fantastic uh, possibility to expand our consciousness. So tell us a little bit about, uh, well, what are these higher dimensions, and why don't we see them? Why can't we jump into hyperspace? Sure. Well, when string theory came along and it put general relativity and quantum mechanics together, it turns out that it did so at a particular price, a particular cost, and the cost is just what you're referring to. The theory works, but only if the world has more than three space dimensions, more than left, right, back, forth, and up, down. In fact, the theory needs at least six, and in fact, probably seven more space dimensions. Now, that sounds nutty at first, and that brings us to your question, why don't we see them, and why can't we jump into them? And there are a couple of answers to that. One, which is the more traditional one, an answer that I've worked on for a decade and a half, it's possible that the extra dimensions are very tiny. They're tightly crumpled up like a piece of paper that you crumple to an incredibly small size. And because they're so tightly crumpled, there's very little room in those other dimensions. And therefore, we are unable to go into them because we're too big. Even our most fine equipment, even the smallest particles that we use to probe the universe, don't have the energy to go into this very tiny space. So that's one possible answer why we don't see them. The other possible answer is we don't see them because of the way we see. That is, we look at the world around us and we see things by virtue of the electromagnetic force, light, travels into our eyes, allowing us to see the stuff in the world around us. According to string theory, it's possible that light itself may be trapped in our three dimensions, and it can't get off of our dimensions to move into the other ones. Even if the other ones are big in this approach, we can't use the familiar forces of electricity, magnetism, even the nuclear forces to access the other dimensions. It turns out that only the force of gravity only the force of gravity will be able to move into these extra dimensions. And so it is our only hope of getting some direct evidence that the extra dimensions are there. Now, even in high school, when you learn about Newton's theory of gravity, it's based on the inverse square law. Yes. That is, if you double the distance of separation of two objects, the Earth and the Moon, for example, Gravity goes down by a factor of 4. If you triple the distance, gravity goes down by a factor of 9. And this particular factor is due to the dispersion of the forces of gravity throughout three-dimensional space. So therefore, if space were four-dimensional, five-dimensional, six-dimensional, you would have an inverse cube, inverse quartic, inverse quintic power, but we don't see that. Therefore, the question is, was Newton slightly wrong, maybe at the subatomic level, in postulating an inverse square law? He actually may have been wrong. So it's quite possible, if these extra-dimensional scenarios are correct, that indeed on big scales, gravity can easily spread out through the three big dimensions, and that gives rise, as you described, to the inverse square law because of the way that the gravitational lines of force spread out. They disperse. But maybe on very small scales, scales that are on the size of these extra dimensions, assuming they're tightly curled up, gravity can seep off into those tiny extra dimensions. Well, I'm afraid that's it for the first part of exploration. Once again, our special guest was Brian Green of Columbia University author of the books Elegant Universe and Fabric of the Cosmos. And if you want a copy of today's program, call the Pacifica Program Service at 1-800-735-0230. And also, you may want to pick up a copy of my latest book. It's called Physics of the Impossible. It was five weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It was the number one science book in the United States, and it's all about whether or not 
any of the dazzling technologies you see in science fiction and in the movies, whether any of them are really actually physically possible in the laboratory. Welcome. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and this is the second half of Exploration. In the first half of Exploration, we talked about string theory with Professor Brian Green of Columbia University. String theory consists of tiny little strings like a rubber band. Each vibration of the rubber band corresponds to a subatomic particle. And that's why we have thousands of these subatomic particles. They're not particles at all. They're nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. Recently, however, there's something called M-theory being proposed, M for membranes. That's defined in 11 dimensions, and it includes all of string theory. This means that perhaps our universe can now be viewed as a gigantic bubble membrane of some sort, floating in a 11-dimensional hyperspace, and that raises the question, are there other bubble universes out there? And Dr. Randall of Harvard University says yes. Dr. Lisa Randall is the author of the book War Passages, and she's an expert on M-theory. And so with Dr. Lisa Randall, we'll talk about this new theory called M-theory. The first question for you, Dr. Randall, is where did you grow up and how did you first get interested in something as abstract as theoretical physics? Hi. Um, I grew up in Queens in New York. Um, I guess I wasn't start, I didn't start off interested in physics, per se. I, I like science, but really, when I was a kid, I liked doing math. Um, I think a lot of people have some specific moment or specific teacher that they point to when they say why they became a scientist. But for me, I think it was just the fact that I really did like um, doing math. I like, I actually very much liked the fact that there were answers, that you knew whether you were right or wrong, and that um, it wasn't just a matter of opinion. And I don't know if that was because, you know, early 60s were a time of upheaval or whatever, but I really liked the fact that there were definite answers to things. And was there a particular book, like in Einstein's early history, that was a geometry book that fascinated him? Yeah. Uh, was there any uh, thing like that? Uh, I know, it's, it sounds kind of bad, but I, I really can't think of one specific thing. I think, um, basically, I just enjoyed doing it, and um, I was, I mean, I didn't even have, always have great teachers, but I did have, um, you know, a couple of good teachers, you know, along the way in junior high school or high school. By the time I got to high school, um, I did start getting interested. I really did start getting interested in physics. I mean, that's the first time I had a physics class, and we had it in tenth grade, the sophomore year. So by then, I, um, I, I, I didn't actually know before then that I actually wanted to do science. But at that time, I, I began to think about it a lot more seriously. Okay. And what was the transition between math and physics? Uh, we've had mathematicians on the program who, who talk about the internal beauty of mathematics, but physics is quite different in the sense we're talking about the physical universe. So what was the transition between math and physics? Well, ironically, one of the things that is kind of fun in physics is all the things that you don't know the answers to. Um, so there's all these... I mean, although I didn't start off from that direction, I think as I've done physics, more, I've become, gone more and more to appreciate just how many things there are we don't understand and how many things would be very nice to explain. But um, in terms of what you actually do, um, I guess I, I did want to do something that was more applied to the world. Um, although I enjoyed math quite a lot, I did want to do something where there was some connection to our physical universe. And theoretical high-energy physics is perhaps the most abstract and the most mathematical of the branches of physics. What led you in that direction? Um, well, I guess one of the things I did is um, I actually really liked model, model building. Uh, so what model building is is sort of trying to get beyond, say, what we know from experiments, standard model, but sort of do it more incrementally um, in some ways. But it involves, so it involves putting together more or less known ingredients, more or less known physical ingredients, what are the forces, how they act, but trying to go a step further and sort of put them together in a more comprehensive fashion so that we can understand things that we haven't yet understood, like where math comes from, for example. Um, so I think I just enjoyed actually just playing those games in the beginning. Um, and then as 
I learned more, then I got more into this sort of more formal mathematical aspects of it. And also, did you have any experience being a woman? I mean, if you take a look I had at... I had a lot of experience being a woman. Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, any negative experiences, I apologize. If you take a look <laughs> at any, any physics conference, uh, basically you see a whole ocean of uh, male, male figures. Um, how did you feel being a woman in the, f in, in the field of, of high-energy physics? Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. I think that it's something that I became much more conscious of actually in the later stages. I think earlier, certainly in the very beginning, um, when we were just doing math or whatever, um, there, there was no question who was getting more correct answers. I mean, that was one of the things that was nice. You couldn't say someone was bad in math if they were getting a better score than you were. So um, I don't think it was considered that strange. You know, I just was doing what I did. I might have been oblivious, but um, at the time it just seemed kind of normal. I just was one of the people who did that. Um, as I got into the field, and of course um, it's not to say that I didn't notice that there weren't that many women. And certainly by the time I was in college, it was disappointing how few women there were in my classes or that continued with it. And, you know, in retrospect, I realized how it could have been a lot easier if there were more there. But I don't think it um, – I didn't recognize it at the time. I think students today actually are much more conscious how much it does affect their experience. I think I wasn't really fully cognizant of it. Um, I just was doing what I did. I oh. think later, I think um, later on, though, um, as you, you get to more advanced stages, oddly enough, it becomes more obvious and has more effect. I think, I think then I felt it more. But there was no problem with uh, promotion or getting recognition. Uh, you, f you felt you were treated fairly by the physics community? Um, well, I wouldn't say everything is fair. I mean, I do, th I do think there are problems. I think I, you know, I did well, and so I, I really can't complain. But I, I think things might have been easier in certain circumstances. In fact, I, there almost certainly would have been easier in certain times. Um, I, I, it's really not perfect, and I mean, I, I just think that it does affect your experience. Um, you know, there's a, it can be an advantage. I mean, one advantage is that when you go to a conference, people do remember you. Um, so early on, before anyone knows who you are, that's probably an advantage. But I think there's a lot, of, a lot of ways it works against you too. Um, and they're subtle. It's not, it's not a big thing. Um, and certainly, you know, overall things, you know, some things work out. But I don't think things are actually completely fair yet. Okay, now let's talk about physics, specifically the four fundamental forces, uh, including gravity, which is perhaps the strangest of the four fundamental forces. So could you elaborate about the four fundamental forces and why gravity is rather different? So the four forces that we now know about um, are electromagnetism, which most people have heard of, and there's also two other forces um, called the weak and strong forces that were discovered much more recently, uh, in the latter half of the last century. And um, we'll talk about those shortly. Those have to do with nuclear interactions, for example, or what holds together a proton. But then there's another force, which is gravity, which, of course, also was known for a long time. Um, but gravity really does seem to be very different than the other forces. And one reason that it's different is just that it's so extraordinarily weak. Um, if you just look at what um, the masses of particles are, or just what we know about particles, um, it seems that it's actually inconsistent for gravity to be as weak as it is. Um, it, the, the scale is just many orders of magnitude. The, the mass scale, if you were to associate a mass scale with gravity, um, it's many orders of magnitude, about 16 orders of magnitude, higher than um, the other masses that we know about in particle physics. And 16 orders of magnitude is something we certainly like to understand. Um, it, it's just so weak, we really don't know why, what's going on there. Also, um, if you extrapolate the three other known forces, aside from gravity, to high energy, it does look like there's some sort of unification. Now, which theory you have determines exactly how precisely uh, unification happens, but it does look like at high energy, the forces were at least of roughly comparable strength. And again, gravity stands out because it's just different. Um, it doesn't seem to exactly unify with the other forces. Well, we're running out of time. However, when we get back to the second part of exploration, I'd like to ask you about Einstein, because it was Einstein who had this dream, a dream to create a theory of everything. 
a theory that which would contain gravity, the electromagnetic force or light, and even the quantum theory of matter. And Einstein thought that it would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. So after the break, I'll ask you about Einstein's quest for a, a theory of everything. Now, Einstein tried to unite gravity with light, with electromagnetism, yeah. and that approach, uh, well, unfortunately, didn't work. However, recently, in the last several decades, there's been a lot of work, uh, especially with Steve Weinberg, who was on this program a few months ago, concerning unifying some of these forces. So could you explain some of the progress that we've made uh, since the, the 60s and 70s concerning unifying some of these quantum forces? Sure. Um, so one thing is when, when we look at um, the various forces, say the weak interactions, strong interactions, and electromagnetism, um, they, at the energies that we tend to see things, the energies we experience, they appear to be very different forces. Um, we know electromagnetism gives rise to a long-range force, whereas we know about the weak interactions. The weak interactions, for example, lead to nuclear decay. That's one of the places they occur. They also occur in the sun. Um, but it's a very short-range force. It really seems quite different. Um, and also strong interactions seem extraordinarily different because they're, in fact, so strong that you can't even isolate um, the particles that carry the strong force. So ironically, one of the reasons we didn't see the strong force was because it's so strong that we don't see charged objects that are charged under the strong force. Now, this is all true at low energy. But when we go to higher energies, the forces begin to look more similar. Um, and if, if, if you go to energies around um, 100... I measure in GeV, so about the mass of the W or the Z, which is about 100 times heavier than the proton mass. Um, the forces are beginning to look more similar there. They still don't have exactly the same strengths, but they all seem to be qualitatively the same. They sort of all look like they mediate fairly long-range force on, on that scale. But then um, you can extrapolate to even higher energies. And I should say we, we actually know a precise procedure for finding out um, how interactions depend on distance or energy. And if we went ahead and extrapolate to higher energy, we find that in the standard model, all the forces have roughly the same um, strength. But if you actually go to extensions of the standard model, and we'll talk later about why we might believe there is more to physics than the standard model. And by the standard model, I mean the standard model of particle physics that includes three, three forces and the known quarks and leptons which interact under these forces. But if we extrapolate to high energy, it looks like the forces have really can have the same strength, especially in extensions of the standard model. Um, so that does seem to be huge progress in terms of uh, forces being unified because it really does look at, like at high energy. These three forces might have the same strength, which means that perhaps they're all manifestations of a single force um, above that energy. Okay, now Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life chasing after a, quote, theory of everything. He wanted a theory of gravity, light, and also the quantum theory in his later years, and he failed. However, today we do have something called string theory, which is the leading candidate, in fact, is the only candidate for a theory of all fundamental forces. So tell us a little bit about string theory. So um, although I mentioned the fact that gravity looks different um, because it's weak, there's another uh, problem with gravity that I didn't mention, which is just that at, we don't really know f f completely how to make a quantum theory of gravity, at least certainly not without string theory. It looks like when you try to make a theory that has both quantum mechanics and general relativity in it, um, you just run into trouble at um, sh short distance, for example. Where, because it, at basically the at, at low energies, we, we usually don't notice this problem because you either are in a domain where either gravity is important or you're in a domain where quantum mechanics is important. And if, if one is small compared to the other, we don't have to worry about it. But if you go to a regime where both are important, we don't have a theory that, um, certainly the theory without string theory doesn't work. It just seems that both forces are trying to um, do their thing and they're just incompatible. However, if you have string theory, if you, instead of assuming like we do in particle physics, that the fundamental objects are particles, which is to say point-like objects. If you assume the fundamental objects are strings, which is to say slightly extended objects um, that look like strings, 
um, it, it seems that these problems can be um, ameliorated. We don't completely know how to combine quantum mechanics and gravity because we don't completely know how string theory really works. But it does look like it's a theory that can consistently contain both quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, of course, it really does that um, in, in a theory with many more dimensions of space than we have, um, 10 or even 11 um, total dimensions, which is to say 9 or 10 spatial dimensions. So it, it's certainly gravity, but it's not naively uh, the gravity we expect. And so there are many challenges that still remain, although it does look like it's a theory with both quantum mechanics and gravity. We want to make sure it's uh, gravity as we know it, which means we'd like to understand um, how we have three spatial dimensions, for one thing. And also, we'd like to understand, see it solve um, some of the problems that it has both quantum mechanics and gravity is supposed to solve. And um, we still have a long way to go in really fully um, understanding all of the string theory's implications. Okay. Well, it was almost 30 years ago when string theory was shown to be consistent only in 10-dimensional hyperspace. And I still remember the reaction of most physicists at that point. People began to snicker. They begin to laugh. They begin to say that this is Star Trek. Uh, this is not real science. And the model pretty much died as a consequence of the fact that, well, where are these higher dimensions? We don't see 10-dimensional hyperspace opening up whenever we move in a straight line or we move in three-dimensional space. So tell us a little bit about the process of compactification or, or rolling up some of these dimensions into something that's very small. Um. So, of course, if the theory really had um, nine dimensions of space that were accessible to us, that we could see, that we could observe, um, that would be a problem. <laughs> it's clearly not the world in which we live. So there's a question. Can you have a theory that looks like um, at very high energy, for example, that it really does have um, these additional dimensions, but say at the energies at which we experience things or can do our measurements, um, we just wouldn't see them. And although that sounds a little bit far-fetched, it's actually a very simple thing to actually imagine. Um, for example, when you look at a piece of string, for for example, it looks you know that it's really a three-dimensional object, but if you hold it very far away, it certainly looks like a one-dimensional object. You really see it as having one dimension in which it's extended, and the others you might as well think of it as point-like. And that's sort of a general idea that... Um, if you have extra dimensions that are somehow curled up or small in size, if you have dimensions that are small, if you look at, at big, if you're only measuring things, sensitivity to, say, larger distances, then you don't necessarily see all the structure that there might be at very short distance. So, for example, if you're a bug on the string, you would actually be able to see it as three-dimensional, or if you're as a person far away, you see it as one-dimensional. And in a similar way, it's possible that um, the superfluous spatial dimensions are curled up to a small size um, so that everywhere there really are those dimensions, but we just don't see them. We just don't have the resolution to be able to um, make out the fact that there are those dimensions. And I should say that that was sort of the the old theory, and it's, it's known as, uh, well, basically there's a clue to Klein theory based on this when we curl up the dimensions. Um, and actually one of the exciting things that Raman Sundrum and I actually found was that there is an alternative, um, but we can get into that later. Okay. Well, when people hear about 10-dimensional hyperspace, they say, wow, maybe I can jump into my starship and go into these higher dimensions. But then they're rather disappointed when they find out that these dimensions are very tiny, very small, too small for an atom to get into. However, there is something now called M-theory, which is generating a lot of excitement. So tell us a little bit about the differences and the similarities between string theory in 10-dimensional hyperspace and something called M-theory. Um, well, I, I'm not... M-theory really has string theory in it, but I think what, what's actually very important that sort of M-theory brought home to us more is that um, string theory itself isn't just the theory of strings, but actually is a theory that has not just strings, but membranes. And all, strings are objects that are extended in one dimension, whereas you could have these objects that we call brains, which are like membranes, um, that are in string theory, and they can be extended in more dimensions. Um, 
So you can have brains of various dimensionality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, you can imagine a curtain um, in your house, which is um, a two-dimensional object in a three-dimensional room. And one reason these brains are are important, at least from my perspective, is that um, there's actually mechanisms in string theory to confine um, particles to the brain. Now, what that means in practice is that although we know that there are extra dimensions, say, in string theory, um, it might be that not everything actually explores those extra dimensions. It might be that things like um, electrons are stuck on a brain. They don't necessarily see all dimensions. They don't travel there. And if they interact with a photon that's stuck on the brain, the photon doesn't spread out. The electromagnetic force won't spread out into the other dimensions. So brains really um, not only change the fundamental nature of string theory, because it's not just strings, but they also change um, our idea of what things would look like if these extra dimensions exist. Um, Because rather than say that everything has to be um, going through the whole, all of the dimensions, um, it could be that various particles um, only experience a fraction of the dimensions. And there could even be other brains that have hold other forces and particles that um, we don't detect at all if we're stuck on our brain. Okay, now M-theory is defined in 11-dimensional hyperspace, one extra dimension, yet we live in a three-spatial dimensional universe plus time, So could you explain to us how the rolling up process is done and does how the what process? How the rolling up the compactification Uh process works and how some of these dimensions could be rather large. They don't have to be small at all. Well, okay, so when we let's go back to just rolling up the dimensions. And you know, M theory just has one more dimension than string theory, which already had way too many dimensions. So basically with M theory you have to roll up one more dimension. But um, so, the, so the picture we had before is that one reason you don't see the other dimensions is because they're curled up to such a small size you can't actually detect them. Um, but and we just mentioned, however, that there's another reason you might not see extra dimensions, which is that um, particles could be stuck on a brain. Now, I should be careful when I say particles can be stuck on a brain because it's important to keep in mind that the part of, basically we, we know mechanisms to trap most particles on brains, but we don't actually have a mechanism to trap gravity onto a brain. So gravity is always connected with the entire space. Um, In fact, Einstein has told us that gravity is connected with the geometry of space. So it wouldn't make sense um, to say that gravity is stuck on a brain. Um, But it does make sense to say electromagnetism, for example, is on a brain. Now, what that would mean is that Whereas before, we might have said, well, so let's suppose we ask ourselves, how big can the extra dimensions be? Well, without, we would have said, for a limit might be set by the fact that if electromagnetism was um, spread throughout an extra dimension and an electron lived in an extra dimension, um, we would actually see consequences. Um, and, the, and if we ask ourselves, we've, now we've tested up to energy is about 100 times the proton mass. So if we say that we know everything that's going on in energy up to that energy, um, we can actually set a limit on what the size of the extra dimension would be. And um, although it might sound very stringent, in some ways it's, it's, it's not as bad as you might have thought. It's about 10 to the minus 17 uh, centimeters. The reason I say it's not as bad as you might have thought was based on just gravity itself. You might have thought it was uh, 16 orders of magnitude smaller. But that would, but that bound that I just gave you, and that's a very small, 10 to minus 17 centimeters, isn't the same bound that you would get if you have brains. Now the reason for that is if you have brains, then electromagnetism can be stuck on the brain, and that means they don't travel in the extra dimensions. So before, actually, one way that we could have ruled out um, having dimensions that were bigger than 10 to minus 17 centimeters is. We would have said that there would be partners of the electron that carry momentum in those extra dimensions, and we would have seen them. And we haven't seen them. But if the electron is stuck on the brain, then it's impossible for a partner of the electron to have momentum in the extra dimension. It's stuck on the brain. It just never goes into the extra dimension. Now, what that means is that um, the size of the extra dimension 
is only constrained by the things that actually travel in the extra dimension. And um, if you want to have the um, weakest bound possible, you can have everything um, bound on the brain except for gravity. And then the, the bounds on um, the, extra, the size of the extra dimension have to do with how well we study gravity. And the fact is we haven't studied gravity all that well. Um, we actually only know about gravity down to distances of about a tenth of a millimeter now, which means that if we have a brain, we can actually get away with much larger dimensions than we thought. Um, and it actually, so it's even um, more dramatic than that if we have brains, and this is some of the work that Raman Sundram and I found. Because if you have a brain, um, from Einstein we know that if you have energy anywhere, um, it will affect what gravity looks like. And what we found is that you can have a scenario with a huge brain sitting in with one extra dimension, for example, in which uh, gravity stays highly concentrated near the brain. So whereas before we used to think gravity just has to spread out everywhere equally, if you have brains, you then start distinguishing some directions from others. So not only is there this effect that you can actually have things stuck on the brain, but you have another effect of brains, which is that they affect the gravitational field itself. And we found that that could itself um, allowed an infinite extra dimension. You can actually have a fifth dimension of, um, that is infinite in extent. And you would have thought that was ruled out because gravity would spread too much into that extra dimension. But we actually found that isn't necessarily the case when you have warped or curved geometry. So brains really do introduce some very dramatic new possibilities. Okay, well, in the past, when we've had some uh, string people on the show, I would ask the key question, and that is, can you test string theory? And at that point, of course, we have a lot of hemming and hawing and mm -hmm. statements that, well, you, you would have to create a universe in your basement. You would have to have an atom smasher the size of a galaxy to test string theory. However, now you're actually proposing ideas which can be measured in the laboratory, that is the strength of gravity, and perhaps the presence of other universes. So tell us a little bit about how the fact now that M-theory gives us a new picture, which may now give us some experimental uh, data that we can fit the universe with. Um, so what's very exciting, um, let's just to take a step back, is what we learned with extra dimensions and brains is not just that there are new possibilities for how things can be um, hidden. We've also found that with brains and extra dimensions, there are actually um, possible implications for particle physics. That is to say, physics um, at energies where we measure things and know things and have know about puzzles, in fact. Um, so if these extra dimensions have connections to particle physics, um, then, as you might expect, there actually would be visible consequences. So one problem in particle physics that extra dimensions seem to address very beautifully is a problem that um, is called the Hayek problem. And essentially, that is the problem of why gravity is so weak. It just seems even almost inconsistent for gravity to be that weak if we just had standard um, three plus one dimensional physics. What was the nice thing about extra dimensions is that they give you very beautiful reasons why um, gravity is so weak. Well, I'm afraid that's it for exploration. Once again, our first special guest was Brian Green of Columbia University, author of Elegant Universe and Fabric of the Cosmos. And our second special guest was Lisa Randall, professor of physics at Harvard University, author of the book War Passages. And if you want a copy of today's program, call the Pacifica Program Service at 1-800-735-0230, 1-800-735-0230. And my latest book is called Physics of the Impossible, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks running. And it was, in fact, the number one science book in the country. Well, I'm afraid that's it for exploration. So once again, join us every week on Exploration when we discuss science and its impact on society. Good day. <laughs>